Oh, Harvard, Mama made it. <laughs> Cor- only been- <laughs> you have no, absolutely. Well, th- well, thank you so much, and thanks for the warm welcome. Uh, you know, I-, I-, I lecture here every day, and I just I wish my students would greet me like this when I walked into a room. So perhaps you can come to one of my lectures, and uh, am I the atmosphere? To- you're definitely, definitely. Uh, scholarship or something? Well, I don't know about that, but, uh, <laughs> but seriously, uh, welcome everyone um, to this important forum, a conversation with Cuba Gooding Jr. and Rick McCallum. Uh, we are delighted that you are here, um, and thank you to the IOP, the Institute of Politics, for providing the space and for um, providing the space for these important uh, conversations. We have uh, leaders in all fields come here from politics uh, to the arts, the sciences, the academy, and we are delighted to have our guest today, uh, to whom I uh, But uh, before I introduce our special guests, uh, we have another special guest in the audience that I would like to acknowledge. Uh, we have a real live Tuskegee Airman in the audience. Uh, Colonel Enoch Woodhouse. Uh, uh, Colonel Woodhouse, whom we actually call Woody, um, is a great friend of the university, a, a graduate of the, the Yale Law School. Um, what year? 1955. Bless your heart, Woody. Uh, I said, the money man. He said, yeah, because I used to pay people in cash. <laughs> I know he was trying to get me to say, show me the money man. He's like, no, I'm not going to do it. Not going to do it, Woody. Not going to do it. Not gonna oh, do that's it. a good one. Well, you, you'll, have, you'll have to give us the context of that uh, a little later on. But let me, let me briefly uh, introduce our guests uh, uh, to uh, my immediate left, your right, uh, we have Cuba Gooding Jr. here. Um, he's best known for its Oscar-winning portrayal, as he just alluded to, of the charmingly arrogant pro football player Rod Well in Jerry Maguire. Uh, Goody, uh, <laughs> Goody, Gooding <laughs> was born in the Bronx, New York, Los Angeles at the age of four. We have some New Yorkers over here. In 1991, he first got noticed by critics in his portrayal of Trey Styles and John Singleton's uh, classic movie, Boys in the Hood. And I will uh, add uh, just a point of personal privilege that the uh, main character went off to my alma mater, Morehouse College, which uh, made all of us very happy uh, at Morehouse when we watched the movie. Uh, and this earned him of the Year Award. Uh, he with supporting roles in numerous critically acclaimed major films, such as As Good As It Gets, What Dreams May Come, and nominated A Few Good Men. His performance in Red Tails uh, was preceded by his portrayal of Billy Roberts in the Emmy-nominated 1995 PBS drama The Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, in 1997, Gooding was on the Academy Best Actor in his supporting role uh, in Jerry Maguire. In addition to the Academy Award, Gooding was presented with the Screen Actors Guild Award, the Broadcasters Films Critics Award, the Critics' Choice Award, the Chicago Films Critics Award. I could go on and on, people. Uh, we have an accomplished uh, actor to my left, and we're delighted that he is here. Um, in um, uh, Gooding has also explored other aspects of filmmaking. In 1993, he co-produced and starred in the well-received thriller A Murder of Crows. In 2002, Gooding received a star on Hollywood's Walk of Fame, honoring his extraordinary achievements. Delighted to have you here. Thank you very much. And uh, next to Cuba Gooding, we have Rick McCallum as the producer of three Star Wars prequels, The Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, Revenge of the Sith. Rick McCallum has helped bring to the screen some of the most successful independent films of all time. Uh, Rick, I, I have you know that I have a full-size uh, Emperor Palpatine, a full-size Darth Vader, and 
Yoda in my basement. Luckily, I have two children. I can pretend that, that it belongs to the children, but uh, the, the, they're, they're mine. That's sad, but it's okay. <laughs> the global blockbusters are, high, uh, are highlights in a career that has seen McCallum and always groundbreaking film and television projects beginning with the 1981 depression era musical Pinch from him uh, by director Herb Ross and Dennis Potter. McCallum has produced movies with, with renowned uh, filmmakers, Neil Simon, uh, Harvey, Harvey Feinstein, uh, for example. In 1982, McCallum reteamed with Potter, serving as executive producer on the landmark BBC TV series, The Singing Detective. They worked together again in 1989 to four-part Black Eyes. Their collaboration also brought to life Potter's acclaimed Dream Child, an unusual exploration of the creation of Alice in Wonderland, which won three BAFTA awards. Now, it was on the set of Dream Childs that met Potter's creator, George Lucas. Several years after their first meeting, Lucas was preparing his first weekly live-action television program, The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. And he turned to McCallum to produce the ambitious, ambitious series, which was shot in 35 countries. When Young Indiana Jones tapped McCallum Radio Land Murders, for which Lucas served as executive producer. During its, in, during its production, Lucas confided in McCallum the plans for three first movies. Together, the sports McCallum has produced have grossed more than three billion, that's with a B, dollars worldwide. Recognizing his contributions to the movies in 1999, Cinema Expo named McCallum its producer of the year. McCallum, the McCallum Lucas collaboration continues now with Red Tails, which, uh, gentlemen, I saw the movie. It was a wonderful, wonderful movie. We are delighted to have you both Thank here. You so much. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Welcome to Harvard. So at this point, we're going to watch some movies. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Rick, who's going to introduce this clip. Okay, I think what we're seeing tonight is uh, a little bit, a small segment of a, a documentary that we did. One of the problems in you know, dealing with big feature films is, is it's very hard to do an historical piece um, because most people want to go to movies to be entertained, in which we can talk about why that's so. But in America, probably 90% of kids under 24 have never even heard of World War II, Vietnam, Korea, um, and have no understanding whatsoever of Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, not taught in a single School. So one of the things that was just as important of uh, making the film was to do a documentary, an ambitious long-form documentary about the relationship that the men had when they went to Tuskegee, the unbelievable racism that they had to face. Then all these guys wanted to do was serve their country. Uh, all they wanted was a shot, just one chance to prove what they could do. They got a shot to go to North Africa, but then the Air Force or the Army wouldn't let them still fly at that point. Finally, it got to a point where we were using 50, 60 bombers a day with the British. That was five or 600 young kids a day. And they had no other choice. There's no other pilots. And then once they got their shot, they excelled in every single way. In fact, uh, so much so that they had the very best record of, the escort, of, of escorting bombers uh, in the war. But after all of this incredible achievement, all of this adversity. And you don't tell them everything and let them see the document. Oh, shit. OK. All right. Let's go. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Come on! Yeah. That's what I really meant to say. Wow. Well, that was great. Well, let's give it a hand again. That was a great. So, Cuba, wh wh why don't we start with you? So this is uh, a weighty movie. It deals with a, a weighty topic, I should say. Um, what, is it just, what does it feel like making a movie that, 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 that introduced to an entire generation of history and unfortunately had been, um, to many, forgotten? Well, that was almost a perfect statement. Let me start again. The documentary deals with a lot of the weighty issues.
But the film Red Tails is more like an amusement park ride because it has all the effects. George Lucas's touches on it. It still deals with weighty. It weighty deals issues. with it. it absolutely, absolutely does. I remember the first time I read that script to the first Tuskegee Airmen movie, having supposedly finished my education and not and having a firm grasp on American history and not knowing anything about the Tuskegee Airmen, the fact that these men and and women uh, apparently an all black uh, fighter, of the 332nd Ramatelli, Italy, but uh, that they were all black educated men and women fighting for our country. And uh, it, it was a frustrating feeling not to know that we had such a, a positive impact on, uh, you know, during all the war efforts, not just World War II, but all the way from the Native American uh, wars. Um, you know, I, I, it's funny because as I learn more about it, learn more and more about our country, I realize our curriculum back then didn't they didn't have an African American curriculum in history. They didn't teach um, uh, teach it in the, in the schools that I went to in the uh, you know mid early '80s. But um, it's just funny that I realize I have two boys, 15, 17, who are going to school, kind of looking at this college too. Last <laughs> week. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Spencer Gooding. I got a pain. <coughs> Spencer Gooding. Yeah. Spencer Gooding. Spencer James Gooding. Um, but a lot of the education I got, and a lot of these, especially kids who can afford to go to wonderful colleges like this, wonderful colleges like this, they get through cinema. And they get through watching films and stories being told. And it was a shame. It has been a shame that these men haven't been recognized so many years sooner. And it's about time, you know. It's about time to celebrate uh, the contribution as African Americans have made to America. And, and this film, like you say, it's weighty issues, but it's a celebration of just being an American. You know, after 9-11, I mean, it wasn't cool being an American in Europe. You know, I traveled there and, uh, you know, dealt with, with that thing. But, uh, but we're, you know, we're a wonderful country. Well, Rick, let's pick up right, right there. So uh, Cuba said it's about time that the movie was made. It took a long time. Uh, for it to get made. Uh, and as he pointed out, it, it, it really is an American movie. It's about heroes, which you've done well. Uh, heroes doing, fighting for its, its country. How did it take so long for this to get? Well, I mean, to make it, I'll, I'll tell you, I had never even heard of the Tuskegee Airmen until George mentioned the story. And he had been told a couple of years before by a very good friend of his, a photographer. And for me, it was just a no-brainer, and for George, so it was this great story of adversity these guys had to go through. Unbelievable, as I was trying to say earlier before I was interrupted by Cuba. Uh, this incredible racism that they went through in Tuskegee. Then this adventure part of, of this incredible that in, in, in Europe. But then they came home, what they had to face. For a filmmaker, that is just, oh my God, this is like, you know, blood to a horse. You just cannot believe that nobody knows this story because it's just a fantastic you know, film that you want to see more than anything else. But uh, nobody else shared that opinion. In fact, once we finished uh, Star Wars, we actually started going back and the movie back together again. Uh, and at that point, we knew George very specifically wanted to do the action-adventure part. But uh, nobody wanted to fund it. So we said, okay, well, we'll go ahead and pay for it ourselves, make it, and then we'll show them what a great movie it is, and then they'll want to distribute it. But sadly, once we finished the film and cut it, put it together, we took it to all the studios, and they still didn't want to distribute it. And that has a lot to do with just the fact that they don't really inherently believe that there is an audience for, that uh, you can have a film that starts a whole black cast. Uh, they don't just don't know how to market it. You know, most of the studios make uh, 25 to 30 films a year. That means every two and a half to three weeks they've got a new movie that's coming out, and they need to push a button. Uh, you know, they need to be on the reruns of Friends. They need to be on Jay Leno. They need to be able to put a certain amount uh, of advertising in the New York Times, you know, which nobody goes and reads the movie. I mean, goes to the movies anyway. Reads the New York Times. So they just push their button, and that's how it all happens. And that was one of the struggles that we ha we've gone through. But for us, it was always just a fantastic, terrific, incredible story of heroism, a great adventure story, 
a great way to kind of get everybody to say, God, who were these guys? Right. Well, you, you both have touched on a, a theme about the entertainment value of, of the movie, and it was remarkably, um, remarkably entertaining. So uh, um, one of this century's most significant uh, philosophers, his name is Richard, he died a few years ago. Um, I want to talk philosophy. I was about to uh, say, <laughs> brother. <laughs> but yeah, he, are, he, he, you know, we are here. I got to say something, right? No, I feel you. Uh, so, <laughs> There's no way you can mix those so two. So he, he says, though, and I think it's quite true, that the uh, treatise of a century ago has been replaced by the sitcom the single most important transmitter of values in our culture is now what goes on in popular culture. So um, I'll start with you, Rick, and then come to you, Cuba. Uh, how do you strike that balance with a topic like this between the, the, what may be tension between the teaching aspect of accuracy and so forth and the entertainment uh, aspect of it? What, what are you thinking? What, how does, what goes through your mind? Well, it's going to be heartbreaking for you guys to understand this, but the film cost about $60 million to make, and then you need another $35, $40 million to get it out in the ads. So you suddenly have a $100 million movie. And in order to break even, you have to really do $200 million uh, because you only get 50% of the, the revenue. So there's only one way to really do that in America and the rest of the world. You have to tell an entertaining story. You have to tell a history lesson. As much as we would love to make, you know, the bridge over the river Kwai version of the story, it's just not... Uh, feasible now. We can't do a three or four hour version of the film. So it has to hit people. It's got to be, it's got to be the zeitgeist of America. And they have to want to go see the film because they want to be entertained. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because it really can, as you say, it is one of the most powerful forces on earth. I mean, no other industry, no software, no mineral on earth can still generate the same, but also attention to the topic as a popular film. But I you, you got to know the Tuskegee Airmen, and you, you really get into the, the story and the characters. So what are you thinking about this, this tension, if it is a tension? Well, let me, let me first say one thing. I mean, because Rick really put, put it to task about the, uh, you know, the main goal in Hollywood is dough, you know? It's Greenism. Money. Greenism, yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, a lot of these studio executives, they're making a wrong and losing their job. But... There's, there's one element that we have to recognize here, and we have to you know, take the moment to acknowledge, and that's George Lucas's passion to tell this story. Because not only did he put his own money up to tell the story, but he knew that, it, like Rick had said, he could make it an entertaining ride for kids. That's what he wanted at first. But then he thought, you know, there is, we, he would feel like he did an injustice if he didn't clarify the accomplishments of these great men. So he put together the double, uh, double victory uh, documentary. We just saw. Exactly. I've been promoting movies for 20 something years now. And I've, usually when you do a movie, you do two days of a press junket, you do a Jay Leno, you do you know, a few other shows. You know, you, everything happens like a week, maybe three weeks prior to the movie opening. This is my third month of promoting this movie. Yes. You know, we've been, on a, we've been on a, no, no, I'm not saying that to you little thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, but the reason why I'm saying that is because when George Lucas said to us, to Terrence Howard, to myself, to Neo, to all these other actors, careers that we basically had to put on hold to toot the horn of this, it was because of the understanding that he is so passionate and he will do anything he can to spread the word on this movie and putting his own name on the line, you know. And a lot of the press has been focused on the fact that he spent 100, you know, like you say, some crazy amount of money because he wouldn't get it financed. And, you know, I had, billion, I had to take that much money out and do it, I'd probably be complaining too. So that's not my co place to complain about it. My place is to focus on the fact that we need like this to champion this story. And he did that. You know, he didn't say, well, I you know, I have another good friend of mine, Jer Jerry Bruckheimer. I play ice hockey with him twice a week, and uh, he's been trying to get this movie Lone Ranger off the ground, and they canceled that, and now it's going again. So these men who are these visionaries, they deal these great fights. I mean, this guy, he knows he fights with the studio all the time. But this was a fight about something that would enable all of us, one, as Americans, 
Americans, obviously, because it's a great American story, but as African Americans to show their contribution to American history. And, and to me, it's like it was a godsend. And, and only it was born out of his passion to, uh, you know, like he says, he told these airmen after he did because he watched some of the dog fights and got an inspiration for that. And he said, I'm going to tell your story. And he held it, he was held, true to his word all the way down to his own, you know. What was the best thing about thing. acting in the movie? Or even two things, if you don't want to narrow it. Oh, yeah, so many great stuff. I mean, my favorite roles are the ones where real life characters, you know, Radio, uh, Men of Honor, Dory Miller, Pearl. You have characters that you can follow and find truth in, and especially if they're alive, you know, that's the funnest thing. So um, the research part is like the gig. That's the drug that we have because we're creating this, the, the truth of this person. So to have these men on this set every day telling us stories that they had to you know, deal with during World War II was a treat. That to me was like the high that has propelled me. And this was 2009 we right. shot this movie. Okay, we shot this movie and now here we are in 2012, finally um, you know, delivering it to the people. So, uh, and, and we've had 30 something screenings. We had a screening you know, with Oprah Winfrey, because she saw the movie, was so moved, she had her screening and she invited Tyler Perry and then he saw it, and then he had his own screening of it. So those moments, and then of course, President Barack Obama at the White House screening it there. So I think those, those experiences are, like you said, there's just one, there's a bunch. So in terms of telling stories, Rick, uh, what about, what was the decision with respect to the Tuskegee part of the story? So the movie uh, assumes that the viewer I think, knows sort of the, what the role Tuskegee played, Tuskegee University uh, played in training and so forth, and it sort of uh, uh, takes off at a point in time when the group was formed and, and so forth. Uh, um, what about that part of the story? Why, why uh, was that uh, not foregrounded? Uh, what sort of decisions went into that? Well, I think one of the things, we, we knew the film was going to be divided up to about an hour up in the air, an hour on the ground. And um, again, as I said before, one of the di most difficult things is we, for, we for years to make the Tuskegee, the European, and then the civil rights part, a part of the overall context of the movie. But it was so unwieldy, it was so big, and it, it gets to a point where you realize that each one of those sections needs its own film uh, to really, you know, properly show and tell people what, what was going on at that time. And we just didn't have the resources, we didn't have the money to be able to And also audiences had shifted from that you couldn't do a three hour, you know, it was very difficult for us to be able to launch a three, three and a half hour movie. No, and try no attention and span anymore. Absolutely. So the idea was to get everybody interested in this part, have the documentary fuel the rest of the part, uh, and the documentary happy to say we'll be in schools next uh, this year in September. It's been part of a huge campaign uh, the teachers are embracing all over the country uh, in high schools and junior high schools. So that the part we itself, and then if the film does reasonably well or well enough, then somebody can either do the prequel or the sequel to the film. Okay. Now what about, uh, same question about stories, what about the, 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 the women? The, the, the love interest of all these great pilots, uh, uh, some of whom were at, at waiting. Uh, but we also had a few uh, airmen who were, were women. Um, uh, they weren't allowed to fly, uh, unfortunately. The, 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 it, it's, it, exactly. Um, um, any thought about that story, uh, weaving that in? Well, when the guys were in uh, Naples, not only there were a lot of African American women, there that were in the Red Cross, but when they went over to Ramatelli, and this is a fictionalized part of the right, story right. what took place, they didn't come for about six or seven months. We didn't try and get into the story of that too much because what happened is, is a lot of the guys did meet white girls there, Italian white women, a lot got actually married, not a lot, a few got married. It, it part of the story in, in that thing because that brought up a so whole So that's another story. Issue. I that's actually wasn't even talking about that story. major story that be told what he's saying is this that yeah. I have women. Yes, exactly. <laughs> what he's saying. <laughs> so I'll cute, take cute. it. And he's doing research right now. The, he's he's yeah. preparing, huh? There you go. You know you always gotta take one dirty. <laughs> <laughs> you just can't let the joke lie. 
So, so Cuba, uh, yes. Rick mentioned uh, that you know the uh, fictionalized account. So uh, uh, when you were in it it Italy, or the characters were in Italy. So you get uh, coming up to you and saying, "Well, you know, you know that scene in the movie it seemed like it was Wednesday. But it really happened on Tuesday." Yeah. Uh, what well, do you think about that? Uh, well, more specifically, that is not B-51 bomber, that's a B B-17 bomber, B-24 It's like, I get it. <laughs> Read through the notes. I get it. I get it. No, I mean, you know, each, uh, like they say, filmmakers say that if you don't finish a movie, you surrender it. Because at any given time, you can tweak it, you can adjust, you can add. You, you know, it's the hardest thing is sitting, watching your movie and seeing something and go, oh, man, I forgot, I want, you know. And it's already out there. So, you know, and then it, come, it takes its life of its own. You know, people say, oh, interesting how you did that thing. And that was but That wasn't even supposed to, that was a take. I don't know why they used that take. How'd that get in the movie, you know? So, but it's, you know, it's, it's the power of cinema. You know, people, uh, they take the Bible, which is, again, why we thought it was such an important statement to make about the Tuskegee Airmen to show that they had, you know, a major contribution in the war efforts and, and to put those black faces up there and, uh, and just not, you know, I know a lot of said the black airmen, but they are just airmen. You know, these are airmen and kids don't see color. George Lucas tells this wonderful story where he had a in there at the end of the screening. In Atlanta. In Atlanta. And these two young Caucasian kids who were going through the, um, the uh, lobby of the theater, going like this. And one was going, look, I'm lightning. And the other was going, no, no, look, I'm lightning. You light, not lightning, I'm lightning. And he's a black character. And to me, that's like, all right, now, now the film's making the statement. Because it's just, you know, it's just, I, th I think it's a healing statement for America, you know. So. Well, I, I've read that uh, great artists uh, like yourselves, when they do a, 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 a significant uh, film that uh, that they evolve as 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 people uh, that uh, that the film uh, becomes part of them in a way that 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 they that they that they that they change uh, that some films are so um, emotionally and physically draining that it uh, it actually uh, chips away at some of that uh, hood for lack Better word. How has the film impacted you? I know you said you shot three years ago, but uh, uh, how do you? How, how are you different? How are you the same? You know, be, besides the education of the facts that we've been speaking about all day today, I mean, just the, especially my character when I research my, it's a lot Benjamin Davis Jr. You know, and the the fact that he had accomplished so much in a second military and never complained. You know, I mean, it's like these qualities are attractive to me in these roles, you know, um, especially having two sons and trying to teach them how to be men, you know. It's, uh, it's interesting when you get to step in the shoes of these, these, these images, you know, because they really are, like, like actors and athletes, we hate to say, oh, I don't want to be a role model, I don't want to be a role model. And my thing is, like, don't look at us to a role model, look to your history, you know, because these guys, these guys are role models for what they uh, accomplished. So, Rick, uh, great first weekend, huh? Fantastic. Absolutely uh, awesome. But I need help from everybody in this room to make the second event uh, uh, better. Did you just tell them to show you the money? Hey, please. <laughs> there you go. You have to say it. I just did. I think he wants to say it. I just did. I think he wants to say it. He wasn't paying attention. No, with, with, how did it go in the movie with feeling? Right? <laughs> I love black people. All right. So. <laughs> what you got? <laughs> I'm sorry, I apologize for all of that. That's not rolling, is it? <laughs> well, this oh, yes, this it day is. and age, I everything is recorded. I guess. <laughs> so at, at this point, at this, well, hopefully not everything. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, uh, have you uh, introduce Cuba um, to the movie, and then we're going to come back and open it up for audience Q&A. Great. Uh, if those of you who haven't seen the trailers that are running, there's been a few variations in the trailers. This one's called Courage, that we think is the story, the all-encompassing story that is the Tuskegee Airmen. Red Tails. Well, look alive. 
Wouldn't want you to miss this war. We're giving hand me down plane. Feel like I'm flying grandfather's beauty. <laughs> they got us out here using planes to mop floors, fellas. Put your head up, son. You fighter pilots. Train, eleven o'clock. It's military. Let's give those newspapers something to write about. Gotcha. We've done every low-down, dirty job you've handed us. You have not assigned us a single forward mission. You're just gonna have to suffer a failure. We have a right to fight for our country, the same as every other American. So you shut us down, or you let us fly. If I get you the money, your men have got to get through. We need to change the way we fight. I need pilots who will put the bombers ahead of themselves. Can you help save lives? At all costs, you protect the lives. Fight at 4 o'clock with the bombers. There's a truck line, only get you killed. Or make me an ace. Right like that. Eight German fighters or you still doesn't change what I think of you and your boys. We don't care. We count our victories by the husbands. We turn to wives. Fathers, we get back to their children. To the last minute, to the last man we fight. We fight. Yes, sir. Junior, get out of the The expectations placed upon you men are high. Heavenly Father, we ask that you send your angels down to surround us as we fly through the sky. Through adversity! To, to the, the stars! From the last bullet! To the last bullet! To the last minute! To the last man! We fight! We fight! We fight! We fight! We fight! We fight. We fight. We fight. up to the audience for uh, questions. Uh, we have two microphones, and if we could start a queue. Uh, four microphones. Four microphones? Oh, OK. Wow, this is a big All right. School. So there are four microphones. I, I can only see two, but two more. In the boxes. There we go. OK. Um, so uh, let me uh, preface this by saying uh, we're asking you to ask questions. Uh, and I'm sure. Uh, people have uh, brilliant ideas and commentary and so forth, but we're blessed to have two people on the stage uh, right now who are the panelists. Uh, so we ask questions, something that ends with a question mark and brief, uh, so that our panelists can answer your questions lively and provocative. Uh, so tell us who you are, um, and if you're affiliated with the university, what, 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 what department, what year you are, and uh, we'll get going. So we'll start right here. Yes, sir. How's it going? My name is Salman Hussein. I'm here at the Kennedy School, and I'm a master's in public policy candidate. Uh, so I'm a really big fan of Men of Honor, Mr. Jr. So I was just I haven't been able to, you know, I haven't had the pleasure to watch this movie yet. How you compare the two, you know, the, the making of the two, what they, both meant to, what they both meant to you, because uh, that was a really inspirational, historic movie, and I know that this must be too. So let's talk Thank about that. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, that one will always be very special to me. Uh, a lot of people think that Jerry Maguire is my most celebrated film, and it m very well might be. I mean, they made a lot of money and awards and whatnot. But anywhere I go all over the world, that movie seems to have people comment to, commenting to me. Uh, so uh, I mean, it's really any, any project, like, like I said earlier, about real, characters, real people you know, in American history is something that attracts me. and. Uh, uh, I think a lot of the principles and, and, and uh, characteristics that made up Master Chief Carl Bashir is the same that is evident in these airmen in this movie. So I think we have one more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, fine! <laughs> up top. Oh, Hi, thanks for coming. My name is Lisa King. Um, I'm a fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy here at the Kennedy School. About the power of mainstream media to change and to help motivate people to bring policy change and um, you know, improve lives for the better, the society for the better. 
You're here at the Kennedy School of Government and our Institute of Politics. What would you like to see this film do? I mean, where would you like to see it go? How would you like to see it um, make some kind of an impact on our society? Well, I think we've been trying to mention that earlier. I mean, one of the things is, is we definitely want to get the story out to schools. We definitely want to make it, you know, finally part of American curriculum at all schools across the country. Um, it's just a very important for us to have the story so pe people will like the film and want to learn more. That's the biggest thing you can ask from any movie, really. And do you have any... No, no, you know, just, uh, you know, just people to know what these men accomplished. You know, and if that means, you know, putting it in the, all the schools. And uh, I was saying to Rick, it's like, what are we doing foreign? Are we, you know, let's, let's screen it in Paris. Let's screen it, you know, Australia and Japan. Just let people know that this is, this is not, not to take away from great movies like Color Purple and, and whatnot, but it's not just slavery when it comes to African Americans. So. Thank you. Thank you. Right, hi, my name is Chuma. I'm a Where Right. Yeah. He's like the voice of God. <laughs> yes, too much. Yes, That's Black too Jesus. Much. That's Black, Black Jesus. Jesus. My God. That's Black Jesus. Go ahead, Black Jesus. <laughs> Look at strong, strapping young man. <laughs> I'm cutting right him off. Uh, I'm the college, and I was just wondering about the relationships between the pilots themselves. Like, it sounds like camaraderie, camaraderie or not, and whatnot. So um, I was just wondering what you learned from talking to the pilots and uh, what, you tried, what you did to try and recreate those relationships back on the set. Well, some of those guys were here because they did eight hard, excruciating days of a boot camp. Now, I had done that already in 1995, so I wasn't going to do that again. <laughs> but these young men slept in the snow and were woken up at 3 a.m. by shots and all of this stuff, and uh, it really created a bond between them. Uh, Terrence and I had been the old man on the set, so we had had a lot of experience. So we would sit around and just talk stories about, uh, you know, how what it, it is to make a military movie and what to focus on and what to get too far up in and, and to, you know, because one thing we didn't want is to push the words or to push the performances. Because, you know, I remember that when I was reading some of these monologues that I had to give, I was weeping. And I was like, man, how am I going to try to say this if I can't even stop crying, you know? But these men weren't emotional. They just did what they felt was their duty, you know? And as we know now, it was heroic. But, you know, if that stepped into my performance, then it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have gotten the points across. So it was just a lot of us talking and living in our space. And it helped that we shot in Prague in that abandoned uh, Russian air base because we had no outside interference with anybody, just a group of guys who did a lot of stuff together, so. Right, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Don Malari uh, Sonoiki. I'm a junior at the college, and there are a lot of articles about the uh, difficulty of getting the movie financed because of, you know, it was seen as a black movie. And a lot of these articles they mentioned, actors like Denzel Washington and Will Smith, who are kind of seen as like post-black, and who can kind of, maybe that's not the right word, but who can, lead a movie on their own and not have it seen as a black movie. What do you think about that? And what are your thoughts, you know, on that phenomenon? How do you achieve, like, post-blackness as an actor? <laughs> how can we get... So passionate. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to wake up every morning. <laughs> no, um, it sucks. That's what yeah, it does. It really I'm sucks. I'm post-black. No, you yeah. look black to me, my <laughs> uh, No, it's a question. I, and I really want to deal with it on a serious manner. Um, you know, it, it, there's a list in Hollywood of actors. Let's just leave black out of it for a second, just so you, I can answer your question. There's a list of actors that they're, the, you know, um, Tom Cruise, uh, you know, uh, Russell Crowe, and Daniel Day-Lewis, that the, the studios will green light no matter what they want to do to some extent. And there are other white actors that are trying to get on that list, that are fighting to get on that list. So in terms of Will Smith and Denzel, they earn on their specific list. We're talking about movies for those roles. The problem here lies is that it's just two of these guys, you know, or three. So how do we, uh, bro the third one? Uh, well, yeah, I guess Tyler Perry or somebody. I mean, there's, if I thought hard enough, I probably, Samuel Jackson maybe. But, um, you know, did you need to send yeah. 
Absolutely. I'm sorry, what? There you go. What'd you say? <laughs> Show Cuba me something. Jr. Yes, sir. There you go. Yes, sir. I do the smaller movie. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing is that we, you know, we have to, we have to continue to, um, well, it's, it's it's one of those things. That's where the, the the challenge lies, and that's you know as long as the new talent is coming up and they're just focused on getting whatever job is available. Like I have to acknowledge Nate Parker and uh, Elijah Kelly and David. Trist. Uh, well, specifically, and um, uh, oh, I'm blanking on his name. But these are two actors that are in our movie that are that have directed, and produced, and uh, made they they're wonderful singers and they're not just acting they're doing everything they're being becoming triple threats and so you can't deny them now I mean Neo Neo incredible. well Neo is Neo but uh, 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 did a music video with images from the movie then I think they're gonna it's put on out. yeah it goes out it's on YouTube now yeah uh, and it's yeah. amazing it's amazing and he did it all on his own and I think that's the next progression if then the give us roles and them i mean the, the the roles that are out there if we just say oh well there's no blacks in that then we will continue to be stymied and we have to branch out and and and, and write you know these guys are writing and do for ourselves so all right well i actually george mentioned it really last week when we were all together he said if we open up at 20 then we're in the game We'll be able to hold on. If we can do 30 or 40, oh my God, by the second weekend, if you can get every single person at Harvard to see the movie, uh, <laughs> you know, um, uh, then, you know. It's on we, my syllabus, Rick. Exactly. Thank you. So we'll then we've got a shot because then other black filmmakers can actually come to the table. Right. Stories that they have that are so important. But if we open at 60 or 70, like Twilight, shit, there'll never be another white person in another film ever again. <laughs> so that's it. Uh, you know, it's interesting. He did say one thing. I do have to yeah. acknowledge that we will have more roles available when we're telling our own stories. I mean, you got these guys like Steve McQueen and Lee Daniels and uh, Ian Tyler yeah, Perry. Okay. I mean, these black filmmakers that are coming and they're telling these stories. So the more that happens, the more that their 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 voice is allowed to shine, then then the parts will make themselves evident. Thank you. All right. We'll stay here and go back around the other way. Um, hello, my name is Fadal Anthony Moore. I'm a freshman here at the university. And um, the question I had um, was, well, you talked about, you know, the green is Hollywood and how it's all about the dough. And um, I got a chance when I was in high school to study the movie The Patriot. And one thing my teacher had us do was, like, list all the things in them that were false or that they, that they left out of the movie or the things that were just purely anachronistic. And I know that you did a lot of character study and a lot of research before you did the movie. And I was wondering... Um, if there's anything that you came across that you wish movie that you think I'm not going to tell know. you that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you see the film, we'll talk about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Buy the DVD. We'll put it in the extras on there or something. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think if there was something that I wish was a story between uh, the Jasmine Sullivan and one of the, the airmen, and, it, and she's a singer, and there was these... Uh, these speakeasies, so to speak, in Italy, they used to hang out. And that, I think that love story kind of got lost because of the grand focus of the story. Trying to tell. But, you know. Sequel. Sequel. DVD. Sequel. That's it. You? Yeah. DVD, I think. Yeah. DVD. <laughs> okay. okay. Hi. Hi. Ooh. Ooh. Uh <laughs> Hi. Uh, definitely. How are you? you? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, Ana Cristina, I'm a visiting scholar from Colombia, and don't sleep on Colombia. Yeah. For your right kids, on. for your kids. Right right on. On. PTW. Okay. Um, so, first of all, I just want to really say thank you. I study linguistics and social enterprise, and I just feel like, I just feel like, Mr. McCollum, you're definitely like a social entrepreneur of this film industry when I see the film, and I'm just, I'm just epic moment everyone you know it's so epic because it's I mean you're fighting for a movie and so the question is what's the question the question is anyways thank you for coming thank you for doing this I love you all and the question is not that I want to get political but we are at the Kennedy School I think this fit the election um, 
you can impact the election, maybe how can it be used to inspire the American people? Well, we just had a screening with Obama last week. That's right, at the White House. And trust me. That's right. He is the only choice we've got. And he, is, uh, he is the most awesome, I mean, awesome guy. But, um, did anybody see the debate last night? Did you guys see the debate last night? I'm scared. Man. I mean, I'm vulnerable. Whoa. Oh, my yeah. goodness. You know, just the airmen fought. Valiantly, <laughs> no, I think I think it's it's stories like these that uh, unite us as a country, and we ha we can't overlook that. And the politicians would be smart to hook onto a film like this. President Obama. Yeah, that's why he's so damn smart. But it's up to you guys. Seriously, I'm going to get very maudlin on them, but it's up to you to really change this stuff because whoa. Yeah. 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 Um, you're the only people who can do it. We need fresh voices, man. Well, here comes a thoughtful and profound question because this is one of my students up next. Hi, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> He's my housemaster in Winter House. Um, my name is Kayla. I'm a junior at the college. And Cuba, you're in a very unique position where you done two movies about the Tuskegee Airmen, one of them being a documentary over at PBS and now George Lucas's film, an adventure. And I'm hoping that you can you know, tell us about maybe the differences in the stories and how it was being told and portrayed. Well, the documentary on PBS, you mean the one, The Double Victory, or are you talking about the HBO movie in 1995, The Tetsuki? Yeah, that, that was sorry. three. Yeah, watch okay, it. Yeah. sorry. It was, but it was a documentary. Sorry. Wait. Uh, yeah. She needs Excuse another year. Me. Another year at school. I think, uh, I think it was. Again, it dealt with a lot of the elements that they had to face just to enter into the military, the segregated military. Whereas this one is the action adventure ride. I think this is the scale and scope of a true action movie, an epic. Um, and let's hope the next one even goes further and tells more of the stories like we were saying, like the nurses and uh, the, the accomplishments and, and things they did uh, during the war. Thank you. Thank you. I like the red. Yeah, by the I was way. just gonna say, I love lovely, lovely coat. Red, tail. <laughs> red tails, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. See. Hi, I'm Federico Quadra, JDM School, and I'm a Nicaragua. So I've had the pleasure of seeing hey. all your movies in English and Spanish. Hey. Uh, I had a quick question for you regarding the importance of having historical films like this, and the difficulty of it is of, of capturing truly how amazing the moment was in the film. How did you commit to yourself uh, as a character and as an actor to study the role and really do it justice at bringing this to light on the silver screen? Well, again, we did a lot of, uh, my first introduction was 1995, and then we actually shot in 2009. So I had all those years to gather my information. And um, being that we shot this in the Czech Republic in Prague, not a lot of black people in Prague. So it wasn't like there and say, you know, and, and do my research on all the plethora. No, I had to go on the set and sit with these airmen that were there and just pick their brain for four months and then uh, just hope that it seeps into your soul. All right. So we'll stay here and then we'll back. My name is Nathan Dial. I am second lieutenant. United States Air Force. Hey, hey. Uh, thank you. Really I'm currently serving service. as a student here at the at That's the Kennedy awesome. School. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. You ain't got to be you. shot at to be appreciated. <laughs> now, now th th this actually explains a lot. I see this young man in, in my gym, uh, and he's, he's strong. <laughs> if I do ten push-ups, he's fifty. I'm looking like, oh my God, uh, I can't I can't keep up with this guy. But anyway, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> No pressure. Yeah, no pressure at all. Uh, now you're my territory. Mm. <laughs> so uh, the Air Force is having the first ever reunion of all the African-American graduates of the Air Force Academy uh, this summer in uh, Disney World at one of the resorts there. And, and on behalf of, as a graduate, I think I have the ability to extend an invitation to you, all, the whole crew, we'll to please it. come down, do something down there at, at, uh, at this reunion, because I think with the movie being 
a monumental, uh, your presence and your story and your ability to question those people. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, would be when is it? It's uh, June 12th, I believe, is the day. So the 15th Perfect. is when it is. We'll crack that. Uh, so that'd that'd definitely great. talk afterwards and give you the information. Would you be willing to consider it? Yeah, yeah oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying all this. I mean, <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> Another one of my students. <laughs> God. Hi, my name is Sashada Mwanza, and I am a junior studying filmmaking at the college. And uh, what I wanted to know is how can young people, aspiring filmmakers like myself, especially African American filmmakers, um, break into the industry, promote, and market our ideas when people such as George Lucas are really having a hard time? Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Give it to him. Give your resume to him. Call him. That's yes, the producer. My name's, uh, my name's Sashada. So I'm free over the summer. If you want to need an intern? I'm, I'm right here. Uh. You go see the movie. Take ten friends. He'll get you a job. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Uh, well, I think seriously. I mean, you are entering like all of you, whether it's the film business, government, or thing. You know, the most treacherous of times. It's economically mm. a disaster right now. For almost every startup business. But the most important thing is, is you. You, you, I know you guys have to make money and you have to look at yourself because you, you're, you just cost your parents a fortune or yourself a fortune. But the truth is, is you've got to love what you do more than anything else in the world because the money will never be enough um, and it will never get you to the place that you need to do right now for the next 10, 15 years unless you are ready to give up everything. And the truth is, whether it's in the film business or government or anything, if you don't give up your 20s, you're going to have a lousy 30s, 40s, and 50s. You up your and you are just totally focused on the stories that you want to tell, what kind of filmmaker you want to be, how you want to be able to express yourself in the most fiscally responsible way, which means cheap, um, then you will get your stories made because right now is also the best time to be able to go out on the web with a film that you've shot. Um, it's just never existed before. Finally, we had the bandwidth to do it. But on every other level, in every terms of other endeavor that every, anybody's interested in here, you have to have the most unbelievable passion because passion. Um, it's a cruel, treacherous, horrible world that somehow we managed to get through all right. For you guys, I love what you do more than anything in the world yeah. and give up everything to achieve it. Stab anyone in the back. <laughs> Anything you gotta do. <laughs> He's not kidding. <laughs> not. Yes. Hi, my name is Robertson. I'm a freshman at the college. My question actually refers to a, a movie that came out recently in those three years between when you guys started filming and when you actually released the film, The Help. Um, a lot of, or I guess not a lot, there was some criticism regarding. Um, some scenes of misrepresentation or like tri trivializing of the plight of African Americans during the 50s or 60s. Um, was that ever a concern uh, for you guys making Red Tails or did you guys just not talk about that? How did you deal with that? Well, because we were fictionalizing a group of real men and we had a great historical, there was nothing in the film that they didn't actually achieve in terms of Berlin, in terms of the destroyer, in terms of how they got together. No, we never had that problem. The second part of let of uh, in Marin County, the most densely populated group of white, boring people ever. It's hard for me to answer that question. Well, I, you know, just simply, that was that story, and they told that story. And I had seen people, and we overcome our hardships, and, you know, we're just happy to be here. This was a story of empowerment, of black men doing for themselves. So I think it speaks for itself. Maybe one more question, and then we really got to go. All right. Question. Hi, I'm Mandy. I'm a freshman at the college. Mm -hmm. um, and in the, in the uh, trailer that we just saw, they said that the expectations of Army men are high. And I believe we can extend that to say that the expectations of actors and people in the public eye are as, as well high. And I want to know what you think, or to what extent, that your roles are important for you to portray things that the American people are lacking and what you as actors or public figures are doing to that. Oh, Amen. Well, God bless you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can't really speak for other people, but I know uh, movies like 
this that uplift our military are one of the things that get me excited about creating a character. Um, and forgive me if I've said this already today, but we've, we've talked a lot. But after 9-11, it wasn't real cool being in Europe and being an American. And I think it, a part of that is because, you know, especially abroad, they only see what we, the images that the media displays, you know. And if I can get in a, a movie that has, you know, our servicemen in a positive light, I'm all over it. I'm all over it, and I'm actually, it's, it's one of my, my focuses. Because no matter if you're Republican or Democrat or any of that stuff, what pisses me off when I hear the debates is when they talk about the military, and then it's like, oh, well, you, then you have to be Republican or whatever it is. It's like these men and women are fighting for our freedoms, and I believe that, yes, we have bad, good people in every faction of our military, but ultimately, this is the greatest country in the world, and it's the greatest place to live, and any way you can to defend that, I will, and that's all I got to say about this. Well, with, with apologies to those in the queue, uh, and we have to wrap up, uh, but we have uh, Colonel Woodhouse. Uh, very well, I wanted to thank the Harvard audience for being here and listening to the speakers. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be and I must say that I've enjoyed both of your performances today, and they were <laughs> all different. And Master of Winthrop, I wish you would present this to Mr. Gooding, please. Is it uh, a <laughs> check for me. Oh, is it? Yeah. Sure is big. <laughs> then on as, the as the Master of Winthrop, you do the honors, but I wanted you to have the honor of presenting something special to Mr. Gooding that he has seen and never will receive. It's free. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, that's it, Mr. Gooding. Thank you. My pleasure. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Me too. Oh, wow. Here, why don't you grab it like that? Wow. That is beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. That is beautiful. Now, Mr. Gooding, I must military man. Yes, sir. Uh, you are out of uniform. You should be wearing a red necktie. Uh oh. Well, this is kind of red. No, no, no. More like burgundy. So this is my. Official Thank you. Wow. Thank you, uh, man. I honor that. I honor you, sir. I honor you. Thank you, sir. Careful, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, wow. And whenever, yeah. whenever you go presenting this fantastic movie, I want you to see you have an official Tuskegee Airmen's necktie. It's red, and it's not crimson. It's <laughs> red. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, all you. I love it. Thank you yeah. so much, sir. Thank you. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.